Ever have a slow morning? This is one of those mornings for me. And if you're thinking of taking my travel mug, it has my name on it. In big letters. No one's taking this. This is mine. Sometimes we have those mornings, right? If you have your Bible, uh, go to Exodus chapter 3. If you're reading with us, tracking through uh, the Old Testament, this is about where you are this week. Uh, Just beginning in Exodus and getting into the ten plagues, and Moses, and the the Red Sea, and and, and those stories. I want to pick up just in the middle of that, and then go back a bunch of weeks, and explain some of the things, and some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, I've talked about before, a few years ago. Some of the things, uh, if you've been around church and the Bible for a long time, you probably know this. Maybe this is just a good refresher. Uh, For some who are newer to this, this is a really cool thing to really grasp and understand as we read our Bible. But I'm in Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to start reading in verse 13. But this is the situation where uh, Moses has lived for 40 years in Midian, which is far. It's it's, uh, it's, um, far from Egypt where he grew up. It's far from the land God promised him. And he was becoming a nobody. He was a shepherd for his father-in-law. And uh, he had taken the sheep uh, on quite a journey. And they were uh, hundreds of miles from where he was living. And at the base of Mount Sinai, where he saw the burning bush. And you're probably familiar with that story as God spoke to him and called him uh, from that burning bush and told him, you're going back to Egypt to free my people. So in the middle of that whole story, God's convincing him to go. And we come to verse 13. But Moses protested. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? So God replies to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am sent me to you. God said also to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. Yahweh, or in most of your Bibles it says, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. And he told me, I have been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you. And you know what? Over the last four weeks, as we've been talking through this, as we've read through the book of Genesis, we've read through the book of Job, one of the things we've seen over and over, and I've talked about almost every week, is this. That this God, this awesome God, sovereign all-powerful, the maker of the universe. This God is personal and caring and loving and intimate, and he sees and he knows and he's watching and he's engaged. And I love here at the end of this, he says, I've been watching closely and I see. This is the God. What have you learned in the last four or five weeks, if you're doing the reading with us, and I know many of you are, uh, what have you learned about God so far? Uh, As Tammy was leading this morning, she talked about uh, God who restores. God who restores. Adonai Meshiv is the word for that. The God who restores. And and as you look at that, um, in, in these verses, we see the name of God. Actually, we see the word God, or Lord, or Yahweh, or I am. We see several times, and they're all names of God. In verse 13, it says, the God of your ancestors. That word God in Hebrew is the word Elohim. And that simply means the true God, the only God, the divine one. In the next verse, in verse 14, it's the same thing where it says God replied. That's the same word, Elohim. But in verse 14, then he defines himself 
as my name is, I am who I am. And that's a really interesting phrase because you could look at that in a lot of different ways. It means uh, I, I never change. The, the word I am, it's one word in Hebrew. It's the word haya, and it simply means to exist. And so to say I am who I am in Hebrew, it is actually, uh, I'll, I'll mix English and Hebrew, haya, to exist, because haya. I exist because I exist. That's who God says he is. So he says, go and tell him, I am sent you. And then in verse 15, we have, in some Bibles, it says the word Yahweh. In some Bibles, it has the word Lord. And I think I said this a couple of weeks ago. When you look in your Bible, and it has the word Lord, and it's all caps, what that is, is, is in the original Hebrew, they were not allowed to say out loud or to write the name of God, which we would pronounce Yahweh. And so in the Bible I've got here in the New Living Translation, it actually says the word Yahweh. In the Hebrew, they would never write that. They would never say it out loud. So it's, it's put in English as Lord, but it'll be Lord with all caps. You know what that is. So the unpronounceable, unspeakable name of God, so revered, so respected, and that's that word there in verse 15. It's also sometimes we just say the word Jehovah. That's another way of saying that same thing. That means the existing one. Very similar to Elohim, but the existing one. Now look in verse 15. He says, this is my eternal name. That word name, you know, in English, we have a pretty shallow, shallow view of the word name, but we know what that means. In Hebrew, it's not like that at all. I'm going to take about 10 minutes and look at that uh, this morning. But that word name here in, in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, was the word Shem. And it means reputation. Reputation, renown, famous for. It's what are you known for? And so huge difference than how we use the word name. So this, this, the, so far this Elohim, that's Haya, this Yahweh, Lord, Jehovah, is his reputation, his renown, what he's famous for, his glory. It's just not what we call him or how we identify him. In verse 16, again, it says, uh, in, in this translation, it has the word Lord, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and that word Lord is the Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps, which is the unpronounceable name of God. So divine, so respected, so feared, so much awe that they wouldn't even write it or say his name out loud. Imagine that you can know that God so personally, so intimately, to the depths of who he is. That's what God wants for you. This God that they can't even say his name out loud wants to know you and for you to know him at that depth. And in verse 13, Moses says, so what's your name? What do I tell them who sent me? So what we, God says, if we transliterate all of this into English, he says, the one true God who exists because he exists, unchangeable, generational, eternal. That's who's sending you. This God is now speaking one-on-one -on -one with Moses. This God wants to be known, not to be distant. He wants to be known. Let's pray before we dig into this. Our Father in heaven, our Lord God, as we come to you this morning, as we come to your word this morning, I ask that, that whether we've heard this stuff before, whether we understand this already, God, I pray that we would see you in a new way, that we would see your name, your character, your reputation, who you are. And God, that you would come alive to us in a new way. We want to know you. And these are so descriptive of who you are. 
So God, I ask that you would show up here this morning in all of your glory. Let us know that you are here and speak to us about this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to understand a little bit about importance of names historically. Um, there are some names throughout history that when we say their name, immediately uh, images and pictures and thoughts and situations come to your mind. And we don't even need to give any definition. If I say the word Hitler, everybody has an image in their mind, right? We think about a person and his character, his reputation, who he is. If I say Elvis or Oprah or Donald Trump or Mother Teresa, all of these are, are, are without saying anything other than their name, we get a clear picture about that person. It's more than a name that identifies who you are. Let's do a little study on that this morning. If you've been tracking with our reading plan, uh, you've seen already that there's several times when someone's name has changed. And that was actually pretty common. You've seen lots of times where, uh, where a, a father gave their son or daughter a name, and it says he, he called them this because, and there's always a reason attached. Because names were super important historically. Naming process, the naming process of a baby was a huge deal. And it could be for a number of different reasons. It, um, it, it could have been a description of the parents' wishes for their, for their child. Uh, an example of that is in the New Testament in the book of Philemon. We see a slave whose name is Onesimus. And he was a slave, and actually, uh, in the story, he runs away. He finds Christ and is coming back. Uh, but he, his name, Onesimus, means valuable. We see uh, sometimes naming a child is a parent's prophetic statement on the future character of that person. In the book of Ruth, Naomi means pleasant. And you can imagine, if, if that was a parent calling their child pleasant... And in this culture, if the child grew up just a complete grump, they're not going to call the child pleasant. They would change her name. This is how it worked. We see sometimes uh, names were given in the circumstances of the birth. We've seen that already in the book of Genesis as uh, Rachel on her deathbed was giving birth to uh, Joseph's younger brother. And at her deathbed, she called him Benoni which means son of my sorrow. And so, in the circumstances of birth, sometimes it was like that. Um, in Exodus 2, which maybe you just read in the last couple of days, Moses had a, a son. And Moses was living far away from home in another country, and he named his son Gershom. Gershom means resident alien. How would you like to grow up with that name? It's just a pronunciation that, that I live far from my homeland. That's what it was about his circumstances of birth. His name may have changed as he grew older. But as they grew and matured, it was not uncommon at all that names would change. And we've seen some of these things. Because in this culture, the name wasn't just what identified you. It was your personality, your behavior, your occupation. Uh, it could have changed if you had new relationships or a new phase in your life or a change in character. And, and this was normal. They called you that. And so here's some changes we've looked at already in Genesis 35. Benoni, I mentioned that already, son of my sorrow. It says that, that Jacob, uh, after Rachel passed, Jacob changed his name to Benjamin, which is son of my right hand which really means he is my strength. What a huge difference in name. And they changed his name. In Genesis chapter 17, we read uh, Abram, which means loving father. As he's 80 years old, 85 years old, without any children, his name means loving father. God comes and changes his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude, which is connected to the promise that he would have a son and they would have, you wouldn't be able to even count the number of descendants. And his name changed by God for that reason. 
But God changed Sarah's name too, and that's an interesting one because her name was Sarai, which means princess. And God changed it to Sarah, which means princess. But here's the difference. They were living uh, in, in, uh, it, where, where they were in Haran and Ur, and God called them to go to the land of the Canaanites where God was going to give them that land and their ancestors. And Sarai was the, the translation of her name where they were living, but God was sending them to Canaan, and Sarah was the, the translation of the same name in Canaan. So it was as she moved, her name changed. Does that make sense? So there's all kinds. It was not uncommon at all. We also looked in Genesis 32 with Jacob. Jacob was born, and his name Jacob means under the heel of. Part of that was as he was born, he was a twin, and he came out holding on to Esau's heel. And so part of that came from that. But that name Jacob also means in that same thing, supplanter or tyrant or deceiver or cheat. And as we see Jacob grow up, that's exactly what we saw in his life. Until later, after he struggled with God, and he fought and wrestled with God, and God began to change his character, then God came and changed his name to Israel, which means struggles with God. Are you getting this? Does this make sense? These names are so important. I want you to see, in this point in history... In that culture, your name carried more than just identification. It carried the connotation or meaning of a person's entire reputation, character, personality, position, the total makeup of a person. All of your essence was in your name. So as you grew and changed, your name would change. I know I've talked about this a couple of years ago, but when, as we read through the Bible together, I want us to be able to understand and see this, that every time we run into a new character, his name or her name means something. That's part of the story, and it's part of the character. And, and, and we see that more and more and more. So let's pay attention when we get to the names. Pay attention when it says, and he named his son because... Because these are important things. It's really easy for us to understand the identification part of it. But maybe halfway between our culture and their culture is you're known by who you are. It's like, hey, plumber. Hello, baker. Is that, okay, we know this, right? There's John's son. And we see that. We understand that in our, in our world, except those names no longer connect. And we know that they used to. But that's... Um, that's the way it was historically. So in Scripture, to know someone's name is way more than identification. It means to really know that person to the depth of the essence of who they are, to know their name. When you see the phrase in Scripture, to know his name, it's not saying, well, yeah, Phil, I know, I know who Phil is. I, I know Phil's name. Is saying, I really, to the depth of who he is, I know him. So sometimes when we look at that and as we talk through this, we need to kind of think differently, take it out of our culture and put it into another culture. And as we read the Bible, this becomes another way that the Bible just comes alive to us because there's so much depth and meaning in all of this. So to know someone's name is to know the person. The whole person, reputation, character, personality, position, the total makeup of their personality, their behavior, their occupation, their relationships, the phase in life, all those kind of things. All right. I wanted to establish that and understand that. So are you with me with that? Because here's where I want to go. I gave you a chart on your, on your uh, chairs there. I want us to look at the name of God. I started talking about this, the I am who I am, Elohim, Lord, God, Yahweh. <coughs> and this is important. To know God's name means I know God really in depth and in breadth. So look at, have a look at that chart. And I know that you, um, this is by, by far not all of the names of God in Scripture. 
This is a sample that came from uh, Tara Lee Cobble from the podcast, and she put it on her, her uh, uh, podcast notes the other day. But some of the ones we've already seen in Scripture, if you've been following along, if you picked it up, El Shaddai. El Shaddai, the very first one there, God Almighty. This is, this is that God is all-powerful. He is way beyond. He is God Almighty. That tells us about his character and who he is. Uh, the one right below that we've seen already too, El Elyon, the Most High God. The Most High God, sovereign, uh, and, and um, above all other gods. We saw this in Genesis 14 with the story of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. It would distinguish him from all others. We've seen already Jehovah Jireh. Halfway down the page, the Lord will provide. And we saw that already. Uh, we've seen in Genesis 16, uh, you see there just below that El Roy, or it's, sometimes it's spelt El Ra, the God who sees, the God who watches and sees, and we've talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He sees, he regards, he's watching, and he's responding. And, and we continue down the page, Elohim, we talked about that already. He's the creator God, powerful and mighty the one God, the divine God, okay? Now go back to our Bibles, back to Genesis chapter 3, where I read before. The name of God. When Moses says to him, what is your name? Who can I tell them sent me? And he says, I am. I am who I am. I am sent me. Haya, to exist, to be. And it, it kind of, this may be a stretch. This is the way my brain works. It's like in Macbeth, to be or not to be, right? God is to be. End of story, period. To be, that's him. That's who he is. We've talked already in the last few, the last few weeks about God being sovereign and in control, almighty, all-powerful. We've talked about him watching and seeing and knowing We've talked about his patience and his grace and his caring and his providing. All of those come from these situations we see God acting in, but his name is in there, and that tells us. So as we read through Scripture, I want us to be able to, to pick up on those and see there's a name of God. We see that as we read through. Next week in our reading, you're going to see Jehovah Nissi in Exodus chapter 17. And this is God is my banner. Now, a banner could be a few different things. It could be like a championship team that hangs a banner, and it's a remembrance, it's a constant reminder. But a flag is a banner. And, and God is my banner. It's like his flag is raised in my life, not mine. And, and he is the center of everything. He is my banner. And you know what? Isn't that what God wants more than anything? As we rewind back to Abraham in this covenant, I will be your God, you will be my people. This is who God is. And folks, I want to know him. I hope you do too. Not just to know him, not just to know about. I want to know everything. I want to go deep. I want to really know him. And I think as we've read all the way through Genesis and all the way through Job so far, Genesis is a book about the character of God. Job is a book that's the, about the character of God, and I hope that you're seeing that. And when you know his name, when you know his name, when we know God, we see in the Psalms, in Psalm 9, those who know your name trust in you. It's because I know him. I can trust in him. When I really know the provider and the healer and the restorer, the keeper of life, and I trust in him. In Psalm 20, support and courage and defense is in his name. As he is our refuge and our rock and our protector. I wanted you all to have this chart. Uh, stick it in your Bible. As we continue to read through the whole Bible, you will see these things every single day. And I want you to be able to have that for reference. 
I think uh, Tammy mentioned also earlier the God shot. And if we're listening to the podcast, she says, what's your God shot every day? Do you know what? It's a skill to be able to read and to see God. Because we start reading about Moses and this character and these situations. But, but when we read that, where do we see God? What do we see about God? The whole point here is to know God. To know God. And we see him at work through history. As the chart goes down, uh, and we get into the second page, there's a couple of errors there that uh, I wasn't really going to get into. You see one on the second page, it just says, R, 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 R. That's just not R, R, R. I, I don't know how that came out that way. If you want to correct it, the R, 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 the rewarder. God, the rewarder is the word Sakar, S-A-K-A-R. Uh, we saw that in Genesis. We see it again in Hebrews. And that is God who rewards the one below it, the SSSSS, is the author or the source. The God is the source of eternal salvation and the keeper of life. And that's in Hebrews 9 and Romans 11. But as we go through that list, it, it kind of transitions and we start seeing names of Jesus. And it's a drop in the bucket. There's over 150 names of Jesus in the Bible. You want to really get to know Jesus? Do a study of the names of Jesus. It's incredible. And, and just, you know, we know the ones, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Light of the World, The Way, o Alpha and Omega, The Word of God. Those are all really common names of Jesus. And they all tell us about his character. But the name Jesus itself simply means the God who saves. And that's exactly who Jesus is. The God who saves. Emmanuel means God with us. The name Christ. The name Christ just simply means the anointed one or the chosen one. And Lord is authority and ownership. So just by those four names of Jesus right there, we get a picture of who this is. His power and his place and his, his role. And as we know his name, we see more and more who he is what he does, his majesty, his power. Are you getting the picture? Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says that there is a day coming that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Notice it doesn't say when Jesus shows up, every name will bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. So I hope you see what that means right now. It means that every knee will bow in submission to his character. Every knee will bow in submission to his reputation. Every knee will bow in submission to his purpose. Every knee will bow in submission to his power. Every knee will bow in submission to his majesty. Every knee will bow in submission to his strength, to the essence of who Jesus is, the complete Christ. Everything that he is will bow in submission to that. Do you know Jesus like that? I hope you do. Do you know his name? Now this Jesus, this God, this all-powerful, all-knowing, majesty, creator, ruler, keeper of the universe, this God came to earth. This God came to earth as Jesus. And, and primarily, if you look at Jesus' teaching, he did one thing more than anything else. He talked about correcting our view of God. Because this nation was so off base in their understanding of God, he talked over and over and over of a right view of God. And that's what these names give us. Jesus also showed us the way to life. He modeled love and grace and he died as a sacrifice, paying the price that we might be right with God. Now, every month, we stop to remember that. And, 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 and so we don't forget. And every month, we stop to express our thanks. Every month, we stop to revisit his body that was broken and his blood that was poured out all for the freedom from sin and its control in our lives, 
to cleanse us, to purify us, so that we could stand before this all-powerful God, perfect and blameless, as wretched and broken as we are. Because of Jesus, we can stand before God in his presence. So today we're going to share communion together because we stop and we remember this. This, this God, all-powerful, all of these names we've read, the provider, restorer, rescuer, supplier, healer, this God, this all-powerful God came to earth. And I want us, as we do communion today together, to do that in the context of who Jesus is, of who God is, the names of God, the names of Jesus. It's more than the awesome God who loves us and cares so intimacy, intimately. This awesome God who loves us and cares sacrificed himself so that we could really know him without separation and distance. And, and, and if you're tracking along with the reading, we've read about the first covenant. The first covenant uh, oversimplified. Here's what you will do. Here's what I will do. And all of it for the purpose of you will be my people and I will be your God. If you fast forwarded to Hebrews chapter 10, it lays this out perfectly. It talks about the old covenant that we've talked about with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the new covenant that Jesus set up as he fulfilled the old covenant. The new covenant is based solely, completely on the blood of Jesus. And he says, I've done everything for you. It's a gift. But it's all for the same purpose. That you will be my people and I will be your God. That has never changed. So that's why we celebrate and that's why we serve communion month after month after month. So let me say, is that the song of your heart? If it is, then you're welcome to participate with us. If it isn't, then wait patiently for a few minutes. Maybe we can talk later and sort some of that out. One of the names of Jesus is the Lamb of God. And the Lamb of God was sacrificed right here in the book of Exodus to save the people from death, to free them from Pharaoh. That was the Lamb of God. And, and, and as Jesus celebrated that as Passover, Jesus took all of those things and put them on himself and said he is the Lamb of God. And now his sacrifice, the, the, the sacrifice is to save us from that death and us to free us from what enslaves us in sin. And it's for us today. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. And after bread, he took the cup saying, this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we stop and we do this today, as we remember, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Jesus. Only because the price for my ransom and your ransom was paid by Jesus on the cross. So here's the best part. How does this all affect me? How does this all affect me? I'm glad you asked. I want to know this God. I want to know this God. And when we read through our Bibles and we see his name, that's one of the ways that he is showing us who he is. But there's something that's even beautiful in this. I wanted to show you this. This is my football. What's it say on there? Brotherton. It's got my name on it. It's mine. So if you try to take it later, have fun, but you'll know it's mine. It's got my name on it. My coffee mug. Don't try to take that. It's got my name on it. It's mine. We understand that, right? We see that, and we know that. And, and you've probably seen the movie Toy Story. And, and when Andy, the little kid, gets a toy, he does what? He writes his name on his foot. It's Andy's toy. Here's the beautiful part of this. This God, this all-powerful, almighty, sovereign God, the creator of the universe, the one who holds all life in his hand, Scripture says, he wrote his name on you. He wrote his name on you. 
It says that in Second Chronicles. It says that again in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, I bear his name. In the movie Toy Story, that's the turning point in the whole movie. If you know that movie, you don't. It's not that much of a spoiler. The whole turning point is when they're in trouble and Woody looks down and sees Andy written on his foot. That changes everything because he knows whose he is. So folks, do you bear the name of Jesus? Is his name on you? This week, you will read in Exodus chapter 9 that what God wants is for you to be his, and I love this phrase, special treasure. Not just his possession. He wants you to be his special treasure. Do we wear that? Do we own that? This awesome God, so powerful, sovereign, and yet so personal, caring, watching, engaged, provider, savior, banner, healer, restorer, king, shepherd, sacrifice. His hope is that you will be his most treasured possession. You're walking around with his name written on you. And everybody knows. Do we wear it well? Let's pray. Thank you. Sometimes it's hard for us to get our head wrapped around this all-powerful, mighty God, creator of everything, sustainer of everything, is so engaged and intimate and caring and loving that you want desperately for us to be yours, that you would be our God, that we would be your people, that you would write your name on us and make us your treasured possession. That's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing that we could actually know the God of the universe. So my prayer this morning is that you would move us all forward in this. It's not just a head understanding thing. This is a whole life surrender thing to the beauty and the brilliance of knowing our Creator. And may we know that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.